Uh, welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming out on, uh, on a rainy night. Uh, my name is Gabriel Broadbar. I'm the executive director of the NYU Reynolds Program in Social Entrepreneurship. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's talk, Uncharitable, How Restraints on Nonprofits Undermine Their Potential, with author and movement builder Dan Pallada. Um, I'd like to start uh, by, uh, by thanking Richard Kimball, uh, whose generous support has helped make tonight uh, possible. And I'd also like to share with all of you just how happy I am to be introducing Dan uh, and not following him. Um, as I think you're going to see tonight, he is a truly amazing speaker with desperately important ideas to share uh, and is doing nothing less than really reshaping the very paradigm of charity. Uh, his iconic TED Talk on changing the way we think about changing the world has been watched more than 2.9 million times. It had an absolutely transformative effect on me when I watched it for the first time uh, just about a year ago, and I'm probably responsible for at least a few hundred uh, of those millions of views. Uh, for me, it was really like discovering a great new album, and I wanted to listen to it and explore it over and over again. Uh, after I saw the, ta uh, the, the talk, I um, read uh, his books and a number of his articles uh, and was really blown away by the thoroughness of the thinking, uh, how pre precisely he untangles deeply rooted philosophical, sociological, and historical problems, and the clarity with which he offers a different path. But I think most importantly in all this is Dan doesn't make this road just by talking. He makes it by walking and also occasionally biking. Uh, he invented the multi-day charitable event industry, creating the breast cancer three-day walks and multi-day AIDS rides, which raised over a half a billion dollars in nine years. Uh, his model and methods are now employed by dozens of charities and raise in excess of $100 million annually for important causes from pediatric leukemia to AIDS to suicide prevention and many others. Uh, he is the founder and chief humanity officer of Advertising for Humanity, an agency dedicated to transforming the fundraising power of great humanitarian organizations, and is the president of the Charity Defense Council, a national leadership movement dedicated to transforming the way the donating public thinks about charity and change. So please join me in warmly welcoming to NYU Reynolds, Mr. Dan Pallada. Ah, hi everybody. How are you? Good. You having a good day so far? Well, I want to thank Gabe and uh, everyone associated with the program for inviting me, and thanks to all of you for coming out to listen to what I have to say. Uh, the cab that was coming to pick us up was uh, uh, delayed by all of this traffic through no fault of the cab drivers and he was very stressed out about this and he explained that he was an activist too and that he wanted to give us a discount on the fare. It was a very nonprofit thing to say. And I said, you obviously haven't read my books because, because of the stress you've been under, you should charge us double uh, for getting us here on time. So how many of you uh, saw the TED talk that I did about a year ago? Okay, great. Well, I'm all done. Have a nice evening, and now, <laughs> well, that that was a, that was a Reader's Digest version of what I want to talk about tonight. So, on this subject of social entrepreneurship and social innovation, those of you that saw the TED Talk, you know that I have these triplets, right? They're they're little. They're six years old. Uh, here's a picture of the kids. There's, well, I didn't do it, and I didn't say it, and I didn't hear it. All right, this is supposed to be funny. <laughs> uh, here's the picture that we show in public to make us look like the model family. Now, the kids like to say hello to the audiences that I'm speaking to, so I present them to you here. Well, man, <laughs> okay, I do this so that no one can really ultimately argue with anything that I have to say. That's, 
just too cute. Uh, you guys, it's kind of blinking in and out on us. I don't, I don't know if there's a cable connection or some, something, but if you could uh, check that out. So I want to, uh, yeah, it's actually, there's no slide up there right now. Right? This has never happened to me before. This is why I'm in therapy. I have abandonment issues, and I'm, they're, they're coming up for me right now in a big way. Let me just call Chris. She's in Beverly Hills, and I'll get calmed down here. Uh, so I want to talk about the, the nonprofit sector tonight. And by no means do I think that the nonprofit sector is the only place where people can make a difference. You know, people have made the most profound differences in government and the most profound differences in the for-profit sector. Uh, there's actually an article that I really love by Carl Schramm, who used to head the Kauffman Foundation in the Stanford Social Innovation Review entitled, All Entrepreneurship is Social. And he uses examples like the refrigerated boxcar, which was not charitable at all, right? It was this very industrial, very for-profit endeavor that ended up making a massive difference in saving untold numbers of human lives by reducing foodborne illness. You know, I get a lot of emails from students, and they'll say, I want to go to work in nonprofit. They, they say it that way, like a kind of a slang. I want to go to work in nonprofit. And I say, well, why is that? Well, because I want to make a big difference. And I want my life to have meaning. And I usually say that you should ask yourself what you're passionate about way before you start asking under which tax status you want to do your work. You know? If you do the thing that you're passionate about, it will give your life meaning. And if you do the thing you're passionate about, it will make a difference because there are so few examples in the world of people who are doing things that they're really passionate about. And if you're doing the thing that you're really passionate about, you will push yourself beyond the normal limits of possibility. And that's really inspiring to people. Yeah, so I, I lost my joke in all of that. I was going to say that, you know, being gay and fathering triplets is by far the most socially innovative, socially entrepreneurial thing I have ever done. That joke, that opportunity has passed us by. Uh, so I was saying I want to talk about the nonprofit sector, and all that being said about the fact that you can make a difference in the for-profit sector and you can make a huge difference in government, if we, if we really want to take care of everyone, if we want, like Buckminster Fuller said, a world that works for everyone with no one and nothing left out, then the nonprofit sector has to be an important part of that conversation because, you know, business will always get us 90% of the way there. It'll always move 90% of the world. Uh, forward, out of poverty, out of certain diseases, but it'll always leave that 10% left over, and that's where the nonprofit sector and where philanthropy comes in, because philanthropy is the market for love. It's the market for all those people for whom there is no other market coming. There is this expression that's popular in professional life these days, which is, let's think outside the box. You've all heard this, right? I really hate this invitation. It's become the new box inside of which everyone thinks. And it kind of pays lip service to the notion of transformation without anybody appreciating just how radical and often nauseating real transformation can be. I think what most people mean when they say, let's think outside of the box, is let's do the obligatory creative thing for a little while, but please do not come up with any ideas that are going to create more work for anyone. And you can't possibly think outside of any box unless you understand intimately the nature of the box within which you are currently thinking. So I want to spend our time together this evening exploring the nature of the box within which nonprofit organizations are constrained to try and create meaningful social change. My uh, career doing this work began when I was a freshman at Harvard. There's a joke about people who went to Harvard. How do you know if somebody went to Harvard? 
they usually tell you within the first 60 seconds of meeting them. And had I not had the mess up with the slideshow, I would have been within the 60 second mark in telling you. Uh, and I was, I was studying um, you know, world hunger and the demographic transition and global population growth and, and, and all of those things. And I was 19 years old and I was learning for the first time about the massive mortality associated with hunger and hunger related disease. You know, 20 million people dying every year, two thirds of them children, mostly dying of things like, mostly dying of diarrhea, you know, and whooping cough and chicken pox. And I wanted to do something big, but I didn't have any big ideas. You know, we used to do these little campus wide fasts for Oxfam. Uh, where we'd get students to agree to give up a meal on a particular night and the University Food Services would donate two dollars to Oxfam for every student who gave up a meal that night. And it wasn't like a Gandhi-like fast because everyone would go to Pinocchio's Pizza that night, but still we would raise like a couple thousand dollars for Oxfam in the spring and in the fall. And a couple thousand dollars up against 20 million people dying of starvation just seemed so puny to me. And for three years, I didn't have any ideas, you know? And you, you know what that's like when, when you know that you've got enormous potential and you've got this fire and you've got this passion inside of you and the universe seems to be conspiring to prevent it from being expressed. And you feel like it will never be expressed. And you know, you'll, you'll die with your music still in you. And so I just kind of let go of it. I just surrendered. I said, to hell with it. I'm just going to buy a bike this summer before my senior year, and I'm just going to enjoy the summer. And I don't know, the second or third time I was out on my bike, I heard on the radio about these two guys who were bicycling across America to raise money for cancer research. And it totally took my breath away. And I realized, oh my god, I haven't been thinking big enough. That's what I want to do. I want to do a bike ride across America. So that next uh, fall, my co-chair and I went back to school and we sat for 13 nights at each of the 13 dining halls at school and we asked every student who walked by, will you bicycle across America with us next summer to fight world hunger? And everyone said no, <laughs> was the, the long and short of it, except for 38 other people. So that next summer, 39 of us took a six hour flight to Seattle and we spent the next nine and a half weeks pedaling 4,256 miles across the continental United States. And we raised about 80 grand for Oxfam, and we got to ride around Shea Stadium before the Mets game, and they played Chariots of Fire, and they put us on the Jumbotron, and everyone was crying, and uh, we got a standing ovation, and you know, that was all wonderful. But when we pulled into Cambridge that last few hundred feet, um, we felt depleted and spent emotionally, spiritually, physically, like we had done the most we could possibly do for a cause that we cared about deeply. And more than that, we could not have done. And that was the feeling I had been so hungry to feel. To know that at least once in my life I had given my all. I had exploited the full measure of my potential on behalf of others. And uh, then I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, you know, I, I found out, I, I realized I was gay. I had wanted to be in politics. It was early 80s. I decided, now that dream is gone. Um, and I was playing music, and I decided I, I'm going to move to L.A. I'm going to try to get a record deal, you know. And because I had these very political views, I, I wrote these very long songs, you know, that weren't like radio <laughs> candidates. I mean, imagine Uncharitable as a song. I'm actually going to write a song about overhead. I've decided this in the last... <laughs> few weeks I'm gonna write a song about overhead. <clears throat> um, so I moved to Los Angeles and it you know the early 90s came and uh, it was before these life-saving drugs called protease inhibitors had been developed and in those days a friend would tell you he was HIV positive and six weeks later he'd be dead you know and you'd be meeting his parents for the first time at his funeral and you were going to a lot of funerals and you were meeting a lot of parents without their 26-year-old sons there to introduce you to them. And it was a horrible, horrible time. And there was nothing big you could do about it. It was like that situation in college. You know, you could stick a red ribbon on your jacket. Uh, you could go buy a $500 ticket to the AIDS Project Los Angeles gala dinner. That was just very dissonant with what you were feeling and what you wanted to do inside. And I never forgot the power of that cross-country bike ride and the power 
of a great journey as a metaphor for the journey that so many people who suffer are going through and felt that the AIDS community really needed um, some powerful vehicle for the expression of all of this grief and disorientation and confusion. And so we created this event called California AIDS Ride. And it was a seven day bike ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And you had to go the whole seven days. You had to go the whole 600 miles. You had to sleep in a tent overnight. And you had to raise a minimum of $2,000 in order to do it. And that was different because up until then, these THON events had welcomed people with open arms, no matter how much or how little they raised, which was wonderfully democratic, but it wasn't a very powerful revenue model. And we didn't market the AIDS rides to athletes or to cyclists. We marketed them to average, ordinary people who had it in themselves to do something extraordinary. So when I tell you we had the most motley crew of people pedaling their bikes from San Francisco to Los Angeles, I mean, these people did not look like Lance Armstrong, you know? I mean, rear ends of all dimensions and <laughs> out, ragtag outfits. And that's what made it so beautiful, to see some 70-year-old woman who is petrified of riding her bike from San Francisco to Los Angeles, but she's lost her grandson to AIDS, and there's absolutely nothing that's going to stop her. And story after story after story like that. That first AIDS ride netted uh, about a million thirteen thousand dollars, which was about four hundred thousand dollars more than we thought. So we knew we had tapped into a deep desire on the part of people to do extraordinary things. And we began expanding the AIDS rides all over the United States. And we did them from Boston to New York, from Austin to Dallas, from the Twin Cities to Chicago, across Alaska, across Montana. And then in the midst of that, in 1998, looked at the issue of breast cancer, which had very similar dynamics where people were losing their mothers and their daughters and their wives. And there was nothing big you could do about it. You know, you could go get a pink ribbon or you could buy Kellogg's cereal during pink cereal during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. That wasn't what you wanted to do when you just lost someone that close to you. So we looked at the issue of walkathons and we asked, why are they always so short? Like, is there a rule somewhere that if you're going to do a walkathon, it can only be 10 kilometers long because that's what they all seem to be. So we, let's break that rule. And we created this 60 mile long walk from Santa Barbara all the way down to Malibu. Same deal, you had to go the whole 60 miles, you had to walk the whole three days, you had to raise a minimum of $1,200 in order to do it. And that first breast cancer three day was four times as successful as the first AIDS ride. It netted $4 million. So we began expanding the AIDS rides all over the United States. Um, and as uh, Gabe said, over the course of nine years, we had 182,000 people ride or walk in one of these events. They raised a total of $581 million, all based on this simple idea that people are really tired of being asked to do the least they can possibly do. Uh, this is a picture of what one of the tent neighborhoods might look like to give you an idea of the scale of these things. Some of the events would have 6,000 people on them and we'd have to take care of 6,000 people moving every single day for three days or five days or six days. So there might be five or six tent neighborhoods like this on any given campsite and that would all have to be packed up in the morning and driven to the next campsite and set up before the walkers or the riders got there. We were a for-profit company. Um, we simply charged a fixed uh, production fee for each event. We didn't do any commission-based or, or percentage-based uh, fundraising. This was our headquarters in Los Angeles. We had about, about 400 full-time employees and 16 U.S. offices. This, we, we did this uh, before there was such a thing as LEED certification. It was built entirely out of raw lumber and shipping containers and uh, tents. It was this magical Willy Wonka kind of uh, place. And that's my little electric car which I could plug into my office there and go about 90 miles an hour down the 5 freeway. Um, and then we had all these tented villages and all the management offices were actually in shipping containers so if you had an executive who wasn't working out you could just pull a forklift up to the uh, <laughs> container and be all over before they knew uh, what had happened. 
So uh, producing these events for nine years gave us a really unique perspective on every level at the way the donating public thinks about charity. And it was during that time that I began to formulate these ideas because I saw all of these injustices. I saw all of these double standards between the nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector. And I want to begin by just looking at some big global social statistics. Uh, we say we want to change the world, you know, but if we look at the needles on the gauges of the big social issues, the world isn't changing very much, not at the rate that we had hoped it would. So in 1990, it was estimated that there were about 998 million people chronish, chronically malnourished in the world. 20 years later, that number hasn't changed very much, 824 million people chronically malnourished in the world in 2013. In 1990, it was estimated in Africa that there were about 175 million people chronically malnourished. 20 years later, that number is actually higher, at 239 million people chronically malnourished in Africa in 2010. In 1992, about 1.1 1 .1 million adults and children died of AIDS in the world. 20 years later, that number isn't lower but higher. In 2011, about 1.7 million adults and children died of AIDS in the world. Poverty has remained stuck at 12% of the U.S. population now since the 1970s. Over the last 50 years, the number of children living in poverty in the United States has doubled from about 11, excuse me, has increased by 50% from about 11 million in 1963 to about 16 million in 2013. In 1992, before we started the Breast Cancer Three Days, about 43,000 American women died of breast cancer. 20 years later, that number hasn't changed very much. In 2013, about 39,000 American women died of breast cancer. Now, you can look at those numbers and you can say, well, they're actually getting better as a percentage of the population. Yeah, but at the pace of molasses. I mean, this is not the rate of change we hoped for 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. And it is certainly not a rate of change with which we would be happy over the course of the next 20 or 30 years. Now, some people will say, well, this isn't really a fair argument. It's not the responsibility of the nonprofit sector to solve these problems. It's the responsibility of government to solve these problems. Which begs the question, well, then why does the nonprofit sector exist? Does the nonprofit sector exist simply for show? Is the nonprofit sector here just to act as a bandage on these problems, never to actually dream of their eradication? And I think we have to confront the fact that government isn't solving these problems. And I think these problems are the responsibility of whoever is willing to take responsibility for them. You know, government doesn't have a right of first refusal on solving the great social problems of our time. So while, you know, Google is out changing the way the world gets its information, and Apple is disrupting industry after industry, and Richard Branson is taking people privately into space, and teenagers in their garages are changing the world. Can the nonprofit sector not dream of rapidly accelerating the pace of progress on these problems? And really, that's the only reason to come together on a rainy night to discuss these things, is to look at how could we rapidly accelerate progress on these problems. Because if we're happy with progress at the pace of molasses, I think we have a system that's really great at it. <laughs> and we shouldn't change a thing. But if we want to see some of these problems eradicated in our lifetime while we're actually here, then I think we need to think radically differently about the way the nonprofit sector approaches these things. And I think that a critical piece of the problem, not the entire problem by any means, but a critical piece of it is that these social problems are massive in scale. Our organizations are absolutely tiny up against them, and we have a belief system that keeps them tiny. We have these two rule books. We have one for the nonprofit sector and one for the rest of the economic world. And I want to look in a little bit more depth than I was able to at TED at how these two rule books discriminate against the nonprofit sector. And the first area I want to look at is compensation. So in the for-profit sector, the more value you produce, the more money you can make. But we don't like nonprofits 
to use money to incentivize people to produce more value in social change. We have a visceral reaction to the idea that anyone would make very much money helping other people. Interesting that we don't have a visceral reaction to the notion that people would make a whole lot of money not helping other people. You know, you want to make $50 million selling sugar water to kids in the developing world, go for it and we'll put you on the cover of Forbes magazine. But you want to invest half a million dollars in the right leader to find a cure for malaria and you and the leader are considered parasites yourselves. And we think of this as our code of ethics without realizing that this code has a really powerful side effect, which is it gives a really stark, mutually exclusive choice between doing very well for yourself and your family, because your family is invested in the decision to work in the nonprofit sector, or doing good for the world to the brightest minds like yours coming out of the best universities and business schools, and since tens of thousands of people who could make a huge difference in the nonprofit sector marching directly into the for-profit sector every single year because they're simply unwilling to make the kind of lifelong economic sacrifice this nonprofit ethic requires of them. Some people have said to me, well, that's insulting. You're saying that the nonprofit sector doesn't have the best and the brightest. That's not what I'm saying. I believe that the nonprofit sector has many of the best and the brightest. But it doesn't by any means have all of the best and the brightest. All of the best and the brightest that we would actually need to solve these problems. And I don't think that we should unilaterally prohibit those people from entering the sector who also have an interest in money. You know, some people say, well, I'm working in the nonprofit sector and I'm fine with the salary that I get. Well, great, then you should keep earning that salary. Don't ask for any more money. But there are some people for whom that isn't the case. And it's a little bit arrogant for you to impose that ethic on them and say that they don't belong in the sector because they happen to care about money as well. You know, if it weren't for people who cared about money, we wouldn't have the major donors that give to our charities and we wouldn't have the foundations that give to our charities. Uh, Business Week did a survey that unfortunately they haven't repeated in 2002 and they were looking at the effect of having an MBA on uh, wages. And so they looked at MBAs 10 years out of business school. So these kids were 28 when they graduated from business school. So on, on average, uh, 10 years later, they were 38 years old. And the median compensation in that survey for a Stanford MBA uh, 10 years out of business school was $400,000. Meanwhile, for the same year, the average compensation for the CEO of a $5 million plus medical charity in the US was $232,000 and for the CEO of a hunger charity, $84,000. Now there's just, the math is inescapable on this. There's just no way you're going to get someone with $400,000 annual earning potential to make a $316,000 sacrifice every single year to become the CEO of a hunger charity. It's literally cheaper for that person to donate $100,000 every single year to the hunger charity save $50,000 on their taxes, so still be roughly $270,000 a year ahead of the game, now be called a philanthropist because they donated $100,000 to charity, right? Probably sit on the board of the hunger charity, probably supervise the poor SOB who decided to become the CEO of the hunger charity and have a lifetime of this kind of power and praise and earning potential still ahead of them. Some people will say to me, well, look, there's enormous psychic benefit associated with being able to help other people. And it's that psychic benefit that's the differentiator. That's what will draw people into the nonprofit sector. To which I've said, look, there's a hell of a lot of psychic benefit associated with making $400,000 a year <laughs> and being able, here's where the real psychic benefit comes in, being able to donate $100,000 to charity and have all of the power and prestige and good feeling that comes with that. You know, get your name put on the building of the hunger charity. The CEO's never gonna get their name put on the building of the hunger charity. And if you wanna say that it's the psychic benefit that's the differenti differentiator, you're saying there's zero psychic benefit in the for-profit sector. Like the people who work at Apple and at Google and at Facebook, just miserable every day. <laughs> No sense that they're contributing to humanity. 
whatsoever. Twitter in the Arab Spring, no sense that that made any difference whatsoever. Um, these are the salaries of the five highest paid executives at popular health charities in the United States uh, for 2012. So that's the American Lung Association, Muscular Dystrophy, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Susan Komen for the Cure, and the American Cancer Society. And you can see they range from $319,000 on up to $722,000. And you look at that and you say, well, I don't know what your argument is. That's, that's a lot of money. And you can hear the evening news anchor or Anderson Cooper, you know, saying, you thought your donations were going to find a donation for cancer. In reality, our spotlight team has uncovered that they're going to pay the more than half million dollar pay packages of these fat cats running the organization. And with that framing, we get incensed. I can sympathize with, was it Mark Rubio who had to drink the water at last? You know, there's just never a moment where you can actually <laughs> drink the water. Um, better Mark Rubio than Rick Perry and just keep forgetting everything that you were going to say. So with that framing, we get outraged, right? But let's look at these salaries on a different scale and let's compare them to the five highest paid executives at popular private health insurance companies, right? So we're still talking about little kids with leukemia. These little slivers you can't see anymore, those are the salaries we were just talking about. Meanwhile, the head of Centene was paid $8.8 .8 million, United Health $13.9 million, Aetna $47.5 million. So the charity executives combined for 2012 made a total of about $2.5 million. The insurance executives $103 million, or 41 times more. But these are the salaries we get all bent out of shape about. These are the salaries we cry immorality over. It's an upside down world that values the management and the affordability and the institutionalization of disease 41 times greater than its eradication as measured by the amount of money our culture is comfortable investing in leadership in efforts to eradicate these diseases. Now, uh, just so that you don't think that this is a liberal rant on fat cat CEO salaries, let's look at the uh, health charity executive salaries compared to five uh, liberal television celebrities. So there are the little slivers again, and here's Conan O'Brien at $12 million, and John Stewart at 16, and Matt Lauer at 21, and Letterman at 28, <laughs> Judge Judy $45 <laughs> million. She is good, right? <laughs> so in this case, the uh, television celebrities made 49 times more than the amount of money we've invested in leadership to cure all of these fatal diseases. Now, I'm not saying let's start paying charity executives as much as we pay television celebrities and absent measuring whether we're actually getting any value for it. What I'm saying is stop the double standard. Stop preventing the nonprofit sector from using money to incentivize the production of more value above and beyond what the goodness of a person's heart will do. Because the goodness of a person's heart will only take on so much career jeopardizing risk, for example, for the same amount of money. The goodness of a person's heart will only do so many multiples of the work they're already doing for the same salary. Now, interestingly, it's not just because it's the nonprofit sector. Um, <clears throat> the head football coach at USC, nonprofit university, right, in 2012 made $3.7 million. The conductor of the nonprofit Philadelphia Orchestra in 2012, $1.8 million. Each of the 20 highest paid college football coaches at nonprofit, tax exempt, government supported universities in 2012 made at least. $2.6 million. And you don't see Wolf Blitzer wanting to do any investigative reporting on that, right? Remember when I showed you the slide and the Amer head of the American Cancer Society makes $722,000 and there's a little bit of a gasp, right? There's a little bit of a gasp in me. My God, really? That much money to try and cure cancer? And utterly no reaction whatsoever to the fact that college football coaches are paid $2.6 million in a nonprofit context. 
The second area of discrimination is advertising and marketing. So here again, we give the for-profit sector the advantage. We tell it to spend, spend, spend on advertising till the last dollar no longer produces a penny of value. But we don't like to see our donations spent on advertising and charity. Our attitude is, look, if you can get the advertising donated, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning or on a billboard behind a very healthy tree, I'm cool with that, but I don't want my donation spent on advertising. I wanted to go to the needy. As if the money spent on advertising could not potentially dramatically increase the amount of money available to the needy. In a uh, liberal 2006 estimate, the health and human services portion of the nonprofit sector, which is about 15, maybe 18 percent of the total of the sector, spent about $1.5 billion on marketing versus $729 billion for the rest of the economy. Or another way to think about that is one message you see out in the world for a health and human services cause for every 479 messages you see for something else. Or if you want to look at it on a, uh, on a micro level, in um, 2012, Save the Children spent $623 million on advertising. And in an effort to get the children who have already been saved to eat at their restaurants, McDonald's spent $957 million on advertising for the same year or cancer and cosmetics. In 2012, Susan Komen spent $25 million on advertising. L'Oreal, $1.5 billion on advertising. Or candy and malnutrition. In 2012, Feeding America spent $2.2 million on advertising. Hershey's, $580 million on advertising to try and build market demand for kids to buy more candy. Those numbers are important in light of this fact. Charitable giving has remained stuck at 2% of GDP in the United States ever since we started measuring it in the 1970s. And that's an important fact because it tells us that all of this stuff has an effect. In 40 years, the nonprofit sector has not been able to take any market share away from the for-profit sector. And if you think about it, how could one sector possibly take market share away from another sector if you don't really allow it to market? And John Kenneth Galbraith, the famous uh, liberal economist, used to say that the for-profit sector creates wants and desires that you didn't know you had. Like you didn't know you needed a champagne gold iPhone with a fingerprint sensor until about six months ago. Right now you must have one of these things. He said that first the for-profit sector creates the product and then through the massive engines of advertising and marketing it creates the market for that product. It creates the demand for that product. It would be considered malfeasance in the for-profit sector to launch a new product without an adequate advertising budget to build the market demand for that product, to let consumers know that the product exists. But nonprofit organizations are expected to somehow build market demand for philanthropy, for donating, for the end of hunger and disease and everything else without ever investing any money in that. The third area of discrimination is the taking of risk in pursuit of new revenue generating ideas. So here again, the for-profit sector gets the advantage, where Disney can make a $200 million movie that flops, like uh, John Carter or The Lone Ranger, and uh, you know nobody calls the attorney general. But you do a little $1 million community fundraiser for the poor, and it doesn't produce a 70% profit to the cause in the first 12 months. And your character's called into question. So we see it in our business at Advertising for Humanity every day where nonprofit organizations are just petrified of attempting any daring, brave, risky, high profile, giant scale, <coughs> excuse me, new community fundraising endeavor for fear that if the thing fails, their reputations will be dragged through the mud. The fourth area of discrimination is time. So here again, the for-profit sector gets the advantage. I used the example at TED of Amazon, which went for six years without returning any profit to investors, and everyone had patience. They knew this is a long-term play, right? Build market dominance with low prices and high volume. But if a nonprofit organization ever had a dream of building magnificent scale that required that for six months no money was going to go to the needy, we would expect people to be indicted. Last year, Amazon, now 20 years into its business, 
had three consecutive quarters of losses. Two days after it posted its third consecutive quarterly loss, its stock went to an all-time high. Twitter, you know, they did their IPO a few months ago. I don't know, now they're worth $30, $40 billion. I don't keep track, something like that. You know how much money Twitter made in the last quarter? They lost $188 million. Can you imagine us having that kind of patience for the building of scale for some nonprofit endeavor? And then the last area is profit itself. So the for-profit sector can pay people money in order to attract their capital for their new ideas, for their risky ideas, but you can't pay profits in a nonprofit sector, so the for-profit sector monopolizes the multi-trillion dollar capital markets. The nonprofit sector is left with the donation as its only financial instrument, and people don't want their donations spent on risky things, so the, the nonprofit sector has no capital with which to try anything in the first place. So if you put those five things together, you can't use money to lure talent away from the for-profit sector because that's immoral. You can't advertise on anywhere near the scale the for-profit sector does to find new customers, new donors, because that's wasteful. You can't take the kinds of risks in pursuit of those new customers because that's irresponsible. You don't have the same amount of time to find those customers because that means you lack a sense of urgency and a sense of mission. And you don't have a stock market with which to fund any of this, even if you could do it in the first place. And you've just put the nonprofit sector at an extreme disadvantage to the rest of the economy on every level. And if we have any doubts about the effects of this separate rule book, this statistic is sobering. From 1970 to 2009, the number of nonprofits that really grew, that crossed the $50 million annual revenue barrier, is 144. During the same period, the number of for-profits that crossed it is 46,136. So we're dealing with these social problems that couldn't be bigger in scale, and our organizations can't generate any meaningful scale up against them. So why do we think this way? Well, in the first draft of my, the first draft of my book on charitable was this really, really angry book. The working title was America's Effed Up Ideas About Charity. And, uh, <laughs> My agent said, I don't think I'm going to be able to sell that title. And I had a sentence in there that said, these ideas come from old Puritan constructs. You know, I had grown up in New England, and I was just very familiar with that Puritan deprivation mindset. And my agent challenged me, and she said, how do you actually know that? So I spent the next six months reading these narcolepsy-inducing books on the early Puritan settlers <laughs> to New England. And the long and short of it was fascinating. The Puritans come to the New World absolutely for religious reasons, that's true, but they also came here because they wanted to make a lot of money. You know, it's ironic and funny that they were these really aggressive uh, capitalists, you know, these pious, diminutive, prayerful people. They were accused by other colonists of extreme forms of profit-making tendencies. But at the same time, the Puritans were Calvinists, so they were taught literally to hate themselves. They were taught that self-interest was a raging sea that was a sure path to eternal damnation. So this created a real problem for these people, right? Here they've come all the way across the ocean to make all this money. Making all this money will get you sent permanently, immediately, and directly to hell. So what are they to do about this? So charity becomes a, a critical part of their answer. It becomes this economic sanctuary where they could do penance for their profit-making tendencies at five or ten cents on the dollar. So, of course, how could you make money in charity if charity is your penance for making money? So financial incentive was exiled from the realm of helping other people so that it could thrive in the area of making money for yourself. And that doesn't just affect the compensation issue. It's why you don't see a lot of merger and acquisition activity in the nonprofit sector. There's no financial incentive for it. Now, this Puritan ideology and this separate rule book get policed by this one really dangerous question, which is what percentage of my donation goes to the cause versus overhead? And we want the amount going to the cause to be very high and the amount going to overhead to be very low, right? It makes sense if you don't think about it for 30 seconds. But if you think about it for 30 seconds, the logic of it begins to evaporate very quickly and never underestimate the ability of human beings to not think about things for 30 seconds. 
Now, <clears throat> there are just a few people in this room, I can tell by the hair color, as old as me, old enough to remember that there was a period in human history, and it lasted for decades, when we walked around the airports, human beings walked around the airports, dragging the luggage before it dawned on us that we could put wheels on the suitcases, right? You got this company called Samsonite. All they got to think about is suitcases. It takes them 50 years to figure out wheel, suitcase. What if we put these two things together, right? Not exactly two new technologies, wheel and suitcase. Well, if it took us that long to figure out wheels on suitcases, you can imagine how long it might take us to inquire into whether there are any problems with this essentially economic question. Well, it turns out there are three big categories of problems. The first is it makes us think that overhead is somehow not part of the cause. But it absolutely is, especially if it's being used for growth. You know, it, it, it amazes me that regulators look to tax forms to measure overhead to decide who's committing fraud. People committing fraud generally are not out there filling out tax forms and reporting in line item detail exactly how they committed the fraud so that to make it easier on the regulator. Yet we still use them. That's still the way that attorneys general go on the lookout to see who's committing fraud. Now this, this idea that overhead somehow steals from the cause or is not an important part of the cause creates this second much larger problem, which is it forces organizations to go without the overhead things they really need to grow in the interest of keeping overhead low. So for example, we've all been taught that charities should spend as little as possible on overhead things like fundraising. Fundraising is really the, uh, the thing people kind of hate most in charity shouldn't spend things on fundraising under the theory that, well, look at the pie chart. It's easy to see, right? The less money you spend on fundraising, the more money there is available for the cause that you care about. Well, that's true if it's a depressing world in which this pie can never be made any bigger. But if it's a logical world of possibility, and if it isn't a world of possibility, we should all just go home anyway. <laughs> if it's a logical world of possibility where investment in fundraising actually raises more funds, then we have it precisely backwards. And we should be investing a great deal more in fundraising, not less, even if fundraising becomes a larger sliver of that pie, because fundraising is the one thing that has the potential to multiply the amount of money available for those programs that we care about so deeply. Similarly, we've all been taught that the bake sale with 5% overhead is morally and economically superior to the professional fundraising enterprise with 40% overhead. But did you ever notice something about these pie charts? They always show them at the same scale. So we're missing the most important piece of information, which is what is the actual size of the pies? Who cares if the bake sale only has 5% overhead if it's tiny? What if the bake sale only netted $71 for the cause because it made no investment in its scale and the professional fundraising enterprise netted $71 million because it did? Now, which pie do we prefer? And which pie do we think people, for example, who are hungry would prefer? You know, we're missing the forest for the trees. We're, we're missing the big picture. We're overlooking the end result. It reminds me of this joke my uh, debate coach used to tell about this farmer from Maine. Uh, who comes down to Cambridge to MIT for a tour of MIT and he's never been there before and he's touring the labs of MIT and he sees a bunch of students working on something and he says, what are you guys working on there? And uh, the students are much too busy for him and, and very quickly they say, well, we're, we're working on a substance that will dissolve absolutely anything. And the farmer says, uh, let me ask you something. And the kid goes, what? Says, what are you going to put it in? Right, so um, I don't know. That went over better in Cincinnati last <laughs> week. Uh, I'll give you two examples of this. We launched the uh, AIDS rides with an initial investment of fifty thousand dollars in risk capital, and within nine years, we had multiplied that 
1,982 times into $108 million net after all expenses for aid services. We launched the Breast Cancer Three Days with an initial investment of $350,000 in risk capital. And but for that $350,000, the Breast Cancer Three Days would never have existed. You know, think about that for a minute. We took that $350,000 and over the course of five years, we multiplied it 554 times into $194 million net after all expenses in unrestricted money for breast cancer research. Now, if you were a major donor or if you were an institution, a, 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 a foundation really interested in the issue of breast cancer, what would make more sense? Do what we do now, go out and find the most innovative breast cancer researcher in the world and give her $350,000 and insist that 100% of it be spent on breast cancer research and essentially buy $350,000 worth of breast cancer research. Or go find the most innovative breast cancer researcher in the world and give her fundraising department the $350,000 to potentially multiply it into $194 million for breast cancer research. And even if it doesn't multiply by a factor of 554, even if it only multiplies by two, $700,000 is twice as good as $350,000 for breast cancer research. And it, you know, my experience in this case was with events, but it doesn't have to be events. There are long-standing documented correlations between the amount of money you put into a particular fundraising method and the amount of money it produces on the other side. And those correlations are all positive, whether it's a major gift program or a direct mail program or a, a gifts and bequest program. The third problem with this question about overhead is it gives you absolutely, uh, it gives donors really bad information. So, as an initial matter, it contains no service information. So if you were to look at the example of two soup kitchens, A and B, and A tells you that 90% of your donation goes to the cause, and B tells you 70% of your donation goes to the cause, we've all been trained that this is a no-brainer. I'm going to give my money to soup kitchen A. Look, they're, they're leaner, they're meaner, they're more respectful of the sacrifice that I've made. We even go so far as to say they're more businesslike. We use that low overhead as a proxy for some kind of business acumen, right? But what if you actually went and looked at the soup kitchens and you found that soup kitchen A was serving rancid soup in a dilapidated facility with a burned out, unfriendly, rude staff? Whereas soup kitchen B, because of their investment in overhead, has a state-of-the-art facility, they're serving hearty, nutritious soup, and they do case management, they're open 24 hours a day, and their staff is really friendly. Well, now it's clear I should have given my money to Soup Kitchen B. So the question, what percentage of my donation went to the cause versus overhead, would have betrayed the donor utterly and completely. So if it's such a bad question, why do we ask it so much? Well, historically, we've been trained to ask it by the three watchdog agencies, the state's attorneys general, and the media, which repeat the information from the watchdog agencies, and sadly, the charities themselves. So this is an example. This is Ken Berger, the head of Charity Navigator at Christmas time in 2009, telling his constituents what question to ask before donating to a charity. You want to make sure that every single penny that you give, we want to help you to make sure that that giving is as effective as possible so that you can give the most you possibly can to the best charities that are out there. The best charities out there from our research have 75% or more of every dollar that you give going to program services, going to the cause that you care about, and 25% or less to fundraising and administrative overhead. That's the kind of charity you want to look for. Right, now that's a little confusing because he's saying our research actually shows that the charities with the lowest overhead are the ones that are the most effective. But here's what it said on their website at the same time. At this time, evaluating the effectiveness of a charity's programs is out of our scope. So Charity Navigator wasn't actually doing any kind of research to find out which charities are the most effective charities. Uh, <clears throat> and then the charities themselves reinforce this by putting the seals of approval historically of the watchdog agencies on the home pages of their website, signifying that the overhead measure, which is what these ratings had often been based on, is the thing that you should ask about. So here's the Hunger Project. Um, there's the Charity Watch and Charity Navigator seals of approval. Here's uh, Save the Children. 
There's the universal pie chart showing our low self-esteem and low investment in ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> there's the Charity Navigator and Charity Watch seals of approval. There's Susan Komen for the cure. There's the Charity Navigator seal of approval. Now, what's interesting is how small the watchdog agencies are. Between the three of them, they have a total of 28 staff, which is next to no one compared to the 10 million people employed in the nonprofit sector in the United States. Uh, between the three of them, they have a total of $3.3 million in budget money, which is nothing compared to the $300 billion Americans donate to charity every year. And between the three of them, they look at 7,700, maybe more like now 10,000 charities next to none compared to the something like 1.3 million nonprofits in the United States. Now, it's not their fault <clears throat> that they're small, but this is a woefully inadequate infrastructure for giving the general public robust information on $300 billion worth of annual philanthropy. So what can we do about this? Well, oh yeah, I forgot to, uh, the, the, last June, uh, three of the watchdogs issued this press release in which they said to the donors of America, we write to correct a misconception about what matters when deciding which charity to support. The percent of charity expenses that go to administrative and fundraising costs, commonly referred to as overhead, is a poor measure of a charity's performance. Many charities should spend more on overhead. Now, for Charity Navigator to sign on to this was like hell freezing over, okay? <laughs> The people and communities served by charities don't need low overhead, they need high performance. Now, I mentioned that I'm gay, and this came out the same week that the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, so I thought I was living in an alternate universe <laughs> or something for the week. So, it's wonderful that they're moving in this direct direction, especially the Better Business Bureau is doing some really interesting uh, things. But it's gonna take a lot more than a press release to change all these decades of indoctrination. So a number of us have decided we're gonna take responsibility for this and we're gonna change the way the donating public thinks about charity. And we've created something <clears throat> to do that called the Charity Defense Council. And it has its tax exempt status, it has a very powerful advisory board now that includes the head of United Way and the Nature Conservancy and XPRIZE Foundation and Goodwill and Share Our Strength and the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving Alliance. And the Charity Defense Council is gonna do five things. First, it's gonna act as an anti-defamation force for the sector because we don't have anything like that and we get defamed in the media all the time. Other communities have very healthy anti-defamation mechanisms. Second, it's going to act as a legal defense fund for the sector because our First Amendment rights are violated all the time when we're forced to speak in the language of overhead percentages rather than in plain English or in the, lang in the language of impact. And we have no well-funded legal defense apparatus to challenge states' attorneys general or local legislators when they <coughs> propose, excuse me, really counterproductive legislation. Third, it's going to act as an advertising agency for the sector, which the sector currently doesn't have. Um, and when I say an ad agency, think about the pork industry in the 1980s. In the 1980s, pork was thought of as this really fatty heart attack waiting to happen. And then pork producers got together, they hired an ad agency, they came up with the slogan, pork, the other white meat. And now when you eat pork, you think you're being a model of national health. So if we can change the way people think about pork, we can change the way people think about charity. You know what uh, pork's slogan is now? Pork, be inspired <laughs> by pork. I mean, they've stolen our message. <laughs> so we're gonna run full page ads and, and full web page ads that look like this, a person looking directly into camera. And the headline says, I'm overhead. You know, we've dehumanized overhead. So we have to humanize it. I'm overhead, my name is so-and-so. My mother died of breast cancer. I do fundraising for the breast cancer charity and I'm treated as a negative expense, but without me, there is no breast cancer charity. My name is Martin Hodges. I'm committed to the end of breast cancer and I'm overhead. Or an ad like this that asks donors, do you wanna be, oh, you can buy I'm overhead t-shirts at the Charity <laughs> Defense Council website to show your solidarity with the people who are overhead. And you're like, some of my best friends are overhead. <laughs> Um, 
Or an ad like this that asks, do you want to be the only donor? Because when you discourage your favorite charity from spending on fundraising, you're saying you don't want them to go out and find other donors. Do you really want to bear all the burden yourself? I mean, that'll turn people around very quickly, right? <laughs> or an ad like this that features the, you know, the ultimate heart-wrenching picture of a little kid with his piggy bank, all that hard-earned money, a little six-year-old kid, and he says, I'm going to donate all the money in my piggy bank to the local homeless shelter. And I want them to spend 100% of it on fundraising and administration <laughs> right? because I want them to grow. We as a sector have never communicated to the general public in this way. No wonder the public thinks with the public. We've never, trillion dollar sector, never taken out a full page ad in any major national newspaper to explain any of these things to people. Uh, the fourth thing that we'll do is draft the National Civil Rights Act for charity and social enterprise so that we have a thoughtful statutory code that actually nurtures and supports the work we want to do to change the world rather than this fragmented mess that is no longer relevant to us. And last, we'll actually organize the sector. For starters, creating a database of the health and human services sector. There's no database of the millions of people that work in the nonprofit sector that we can call upon to take action when something comes up that's uh, against our common interest. If you want to get involved, you can go to charitydefensecouncil.org, and I hope that you will. And I'm, I'm going to close with this. This is the ribbon that's on the cover of my book, Uncharitable, and I bought this piece of linen at a store in Hollywood at the time, and I tore it apart by the threads, and I found an oil stain in the street, and I ground it in until it became, for me, a symbol of the desecration of our dreams on the altar of appearances. And I think in the final analysis, more than changing the way people think about charity and more than investing in fundraising, the nonprofit sector has to return to the wild-eyed dreams that got people into this work in the first place when we were young, like you are, and believed that we could actually eradicate these problems in our lifetime. None of us wants our epitaph to read, we kept charity overhead low. <clears throat> we want it to read that we changed the world. Now, I know in this day and age, you can be made to feel stupid for talking about dreams, right? <laughs> dreams aren't academic things. Dreams are silly. Dreams are unserious. Dreams are sophomoric. You know, there are urgent problems waiting to be solved right now. We can't afford the luxury of, you know, engaging in your childish dreams. But I don't think that dreams are childish, silly things. I think that a dream taken seriously, underlined taken seriously, is the most sophisticated thing known to humanity. You look at the sophistication of the Apollo program. A great dream drives collaboration. It isn't the other way around. A great dream drives innovation. It isn't the other way around. What's silly and what's sophomoric and what's unserious is to squander our time on this earth and our real human potential on anything less than a great dream. So that's the box. And we need to get out of it for the sake of ourselves and all those that we hope to serve. And those of you that are young are going to have to be the ones that lead us out of this box. And if you can do that, that will really be fulfilling the promise of social entrepreneurship. Thank you very, very much. And if we have some time for questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Is, am I good? Working? Hi. I'm Maho Khodi. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. I'm a um, Reynolds alumni from 2008. And I'm really interested in a lot of the questions that you're, you know, a lot of the themes you're bringing up, you're speaking to the choir, I am overhead. The thing that I'm really interested in though is the growth of for-profit social enterprises and how they inform what you're talking about. Is there a shift that they're forcing into the way people 
perceive not-for-profits. Where do they fit into this conversation? Yeah, well, um, two things. I think it's really, the choir needs to be taught to sing, right? So it's really important that we do some preaching to the choir, that we have an intellectual arsenal that we can begin to take out into the world <clears throat> um, to change these things. And second, I don't know about the general public. I don't think there's been very much change whatsoever in the way the general public thinks. If you go out onto the street right now and ask 100 people, what question should you ask before you donate to charity, for example, they're all going to say, well, you should definitely ask about the overhead and how much the CEO is paid. There's, there's a bubble you know, at the academic and thought leadership level where, because we've moved on from overhead, we think the rest of the world has moved on from overhead. Well, the rest of the world hasn't taken a step away from overhead. And I think the same thing is going on um, with this for-profit social enterprise uh, question. It's kind of all the rage right now, and I, and I think that's great, you know? And, and I think um, the more momentum we can get in the for-profit sector and the more social responsibility we can get in the for-profit sector, the better. But it has zero effect whatsoever on these prohibitions in the nonprofit sector. They still exist. And, you know, I've been at different conferences where I'll hear certain experts in social enterprise kind of, uh, you know, signal the, the death knoll for philanthropy in the nonprofit sector and charity. We don't really need it anymore. Business is going to take care, and social business is going to take care of all these things. And as I said in the TED Talk, you know, I'm sorry, but that's just not going to happen. There are some <clears throat> issues uh, for which you just can't develop the kind of money measures that you need for social business. I, I had a phone call with a couple uh, last week, and their, their seven-year-old son has this rare form of pediatric cancer called Ewing sarcoma, and it only affects about... 200 kids a year. All right, well, that's a perfect example of where you need philanthropy because there, there's no market mechanism. You know, the market incentives aren't there to take care of that <clears throat> kind of a disease. Or, you know, the, uh, I served uh, for a few years on a, uh, the board of a center for the developmentally disabled. And as I said in TED, you know, a lot of those people just need, need, they need love, you know, and they need nurturing, and they need company, and they need support, and that's important. How on earth do you monetize that? But I began to see the, the organization moving toward um, trying to employ the higher functioning clients because that was a better revenue model. Well, that really raises the soul of the issue. Are we a business or are we a charity? Because there are these not so high functioning people that really need our help. And if you're just chasing money, they're gonna be left behind. That is the whole purpose of philanthropy. So as I said, on, if, if we want, a, you know, we're making great progress on, on things like uh, poverty and we're making progress on malaria and you, and you see the advent of cell phones changing Africa. And you know, and what's gonna happen is what's happened everywhere else. You know, 90% of Africa will get lifted out of poverty, but there'll still be 10% living in poverty. And we kind of say, well, the job's done, you know, at, at 90%. And it isn't, right? And if we if we want a world where we take care of everyone, then philanthropy is the answer. It's the market for love. It's it's where people get to express their love with their money in a place where no other kind of incentive exists. That's what I think. Hi, my name is Jenny Jung, currently an MPA student at NYU Wagner. And Hi. this question is in regards to these for-profit social ventures, specifically B Corps. So with the rise of them, do you think that the uh, nonprofit, nonprofit organization's ability to uh, compete for capital and for talent are, will be helped or hindered by the rise of B Corps? I think it's all too small right now to have any kind of uh, measurable impact. I, I think that the, the key for the nonprofit sector is to get out there and compete for the fungible consumer dollar. Money is fungible and a dollar uh, that you spend uh, on popcorn at the movies can also be used to uh, go to invisible children. 
And, you know, I was at Whole Foods the other day, and they had this, they had pre-bagged groceries for a homeless shelter right there at the checkout counter. And I think they were measured by weight or something. And this particular grocery bag cost, you know, $39, $49, something like that. And I could just put it on the conveyor, and they would charge me for that. And that bag of groceries would go right to the homeless shelter. And I thought, oh, that's, ter that's, that's terrific. I'm going to do that. You know, that's a form of asking. That's a form of building market demand. And I gave whatever it was, $39 or $49, that I would not otherwise have given. And I didn't make some note somewhere that, okay, I'm now going to give $39 less somewhere else. <clears throat> you know, this 2% this is not a threshold. You look at some communities, they tithe 10%, right? Human beings aren't wired in our DNA to only give 2% of our income to charity. The more we excite that desire to help others through, um, you know, modern marketing methods, the, the more money charities will raise. And I think that's where they need to focus rather than on B Corps. For too long, charity uh, as competition, for too long, charities have, have considered their peers competition. And I, I think, you know, the real insidious competition is Budweiser and BMW and Rolex. That's where all the big money is going, you know. That's, those are the entities that charities are competing against. Um, uh, one thing you mentioned about compensation and the idea of, well, you didn't really mention it, but you could prove that Judge Judy creates value, right? Because people watch her show and that generates advertising dollars. Very, very difficult to prove that we're creating value in the nonprofit <coughs> sector. Um, and I'm wondering what examples you've seen of methods by which people are establishing a language of proof, both impact metrics or commonly accepted ones. I know that's a big problem. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I don't think it's that easy, that difficult to, to prove uh, that, to prove value in some cases, okay? In some cases where you've got a program that has been vetted and that you know is having an impact. You like Share Our Strength and the No Kid Hungry program and you know, they translate their dollars into advocacy that frees up more federal money to get kids uh, breakfast in school, right? So, um, or, uh, you know, different teenage gang mentoring. If, if you know the problem is, impact, if you know that the charity is impactful already, then money is a proxy for impact, right? And, and increasing that program and spreading that program far and wide, you know you're having more impact because you already know that program has a particular impact. So if you can hire a leader that can quadruple revenues for that program, that you know is having an impact uh, there. You, you know that more money has produced more value. In those cases where you can't measure impact, then no. Money cannot be used as a proxy for value, and that's really dangerous. And we have to wield this power of fundraising um, very responsibly. You know, in, in my own case, in my own career, I saw people um, using low overhead numbers uh, to compete with us when, when they were doing all kinds of accounting to, to, to change those overhead numbers and make them look lower. And to me, that was a great, great injustice. So the last thing that should happen is organizations that are really savvy about fundraising, but have no clue whether they're having an impact and don't really have a huge incentive to prove whether they're having an impact, that would be tremendously unjust. So in those cases, we have to engage the yes, difficult question of how do you measure impact. and and. You know, that's complicated, and I think the real enemy here has been our addiction to simplicity. It hasn't necessarily been the overhead measure. It's been this addiction to simplicity. You know, Einstein had this favorite, famous quote where he said, I wouldn't give a nickel for the simplicity on this kind of complexity, this side of complexity, but I'd give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And we run the risk of being just as stupid about this impact question as we have been about overhead. And you start to see it now where you see on charity websites the word impact and effectiveness and on overhead, and on their annual reports a lot. And Charity Navigator is actually, you know, I sat down with Ken Berger for breakfast and he said, you know, one of the ways we're going to start looking at impact is we're going to start looking at charity websites and seeing how much they talk about impact. Well, 
you're just going to have this epidemic of the use of the word impact in the sector. And it's every bit as nauseating or more so than the overhead conversation. And there's some counterintuitive stuff to, to think about here. Like you don't necessarily want to be measuring effectiveness because if you measure effectiveness and you reward people for effectiveness, you're going to have a run on all of the problems that are easiest to show effectiveness on. We sold the most malaria nets. We, we served the, the most bowls of soup to the homeless. So what you really want to look at is what I would call the intention to be effective. Now, how could you measure the intention to be effective? Well, there are some interesting questions that you could ask systematically, like what are your goals? What progress are you making toward those goals? And how do you know? What are your goals? If you ask an executive director what are your goals and the executive director can't tell you what their goals are, well, that would give you some indication that they might not have a lot of intention to be effective. If only the executive director can tell you the goals and nobody else in the organization can, that might tell you, well, this is more of a public relations exercise than it is a real uh, meaningful aspiration. Then what kind of data do you collect? Do you collect any data at all? You know, medical researchers, right, they, all they do is collect data. That shows you some intention to be effective. Do you collect data on this homelessness problem or this gang mentoring pro uh, problem? What do you do with the data? Do you have data analysts on the, on the staff? Uh, so I think those are the kinds of questions for the more vexing social problems. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dan. I hi. am a, I'm a founder of a nonprofit. I'm in my 20s. And my question becomes, what happens uh, when, like you said yourself, we have marketing and brand messages that are, have been more effective in the private sector? The, and directly then what happens, uh, how do we and uh, our young, young, the, the, young, the young leadership in the nonprofit sector is able to either A, become better business people for, like the private sector has clearly shown for millennia? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you phrase it in a different way? Sure. So how do we learn from the private sector in applying uh, leadership uh, in, the private, in the nonprofit sector uh, knowing that they have been so effective with marketing and brand message and revenue and so on and so forth? Well, that's a tricky question. You know, a lot of people dumb down my message and, and it makes me crazy. They'll say, oh, Dan Pilato, he's the guy saying charities should act more like businesses. No, no, that is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all because that makes it sound like they're too stupid to act like businesses, right? I'm saying we are not for a moment ready to give charities the big league permissions we really give to business. So would you please stop telling charities to act more like business when it's a disingenuous request? Because you don't really mean it, you know? Um, I don't, you know, if we would start to give charities the permission or if we as a nonprofit sector would start to fight for the permissions ourselves, the ability to do the things that the for-profit sector does, that's a bit of a no-brainer, you know? That's fairly easy. We can learn to do it. We can hire talent that's done it in the past. I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think they have so much, uh, you know, knowledge that we aren't able to get. It's really this mindset issue and this issue of the permissions in our culture that's critical. Hi, my name is Ashley Kalaya. I am getting ready to graduate from the Wagner School of Public Service with an MPA. Um, thank you so much for starting this conversation. My question is, I'm finding myself headed toward the direction of social entrepreneurship, as I think that many people in this room currently are, um, away from the nonprofit sector because of any number of the reasons, all of the reasons that you enumerated. Um, and my question is, taking at face value the fact that the arsenal that you've given us or that you're, the, that you're trying to give folks in the nonprofit sector um, is valuable, and we can all go out and be, and be allies, what advice would you have to folks who are maybe considering starting something like a social enterprise or a social venture rather than a nonprofit, would you say, um, be my ally if that's what you're going to do, or would you say maybe consider starting a nonprofit? I would say be careful of heading into an abstraction. And I hear this a lot, and it, it 
concerns me a little bit with people saying, I, I, I want to go into social entrepreneurship. Well, what does that mean? Like Walt Disney had a mouse, and he was really passionate about that mouse. You know, <laughs> Bruce Springsteen had a guitar, and he, want, and he was really passionate about that guitar. Steve Jobs had, you know, the little motherboard, and he was really passionate about that. Like, what is the thing you're really passionate about? Is it chocolate? Is it clothing? Is it amusement parks? Is it, what is it, you know? Uh, um, now you may have that mental health for me. It's mental health, yes. <laughs> Definitely also stay chocolate. out of the nonprofit sector. If your mental health is important to you, no. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't sway you one way or another. You know, uh, I don't. Uh, it, there's no predicting. Uh, the, the key is that you're going to be happy doing it. You know, uh, I. We're, we're trying to fund a, a big new exciting enterprise right now and and when we were trying to structure it uh, it looked like the only sensible way to do it was to do it as a nonprofit and so I said all right we'll create this as a nonprofit entity and and a few weeks into it people started to say to me you don't you don't seem that excited about this and I said you know I'm not I'm not I'm not excited about putting my own money and my own sweat into something that I can't own, you know, that I'm never going to have any equity in, that somebody could take away from me completely one day. And I changed my mind. I said, I I'm going to do this as a for-profit entity. For me, that's important. For other people, it isn't. You look at Adam Braun and Pencils of Promise, and, and there's enormous psychic benefit with being a celebrated social entrepreneur, you know. My friend Peter Di Diamandis and the XPRIZE Foundation, you know, if you rise to kind of that level, there are a lot of other benefits that come with it. But you've got to decide what's important to you. You know, it's different for everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Ashley, also Ashley Putnam. I'm an MPA student and I am overhead as well. Uh -huh. I currently work in a position that's both fundraising and talent acquisition. And I wanted to ask you a question about the compensation piece. Um, I find in this field, there's a lot of people who want to do social good. They come from JDs, MBAs, MPAs. It's really easy to get the talent. The problem we often have is retaining the talent. Yeah. So they come in and they start doing the work and it's actually really hard and it's an uphill battle and we don't have enough funding and it's very stressful. So how do you begin to start this conversation with funders about career development and building up talent and retaining people? Um, yeah. When you start talking about that. Well, there are three elements to this. I mean, I talk about these five things because it's a holistic problem. And people like to pull out, for some reason, you know, people are really drawn to the executive compensation issue. It brings up all the capitalist, socialist, right, left, all that kind of emotion. And, and so, you know, all right, look, I'll give you the executive compensation. I'll grant you. Money doesn't matter. Don't pay people any more money. I was wrong about that. Now tell people, you can't use money to hire other talented people, you don't have an advertising budget, you can't take any risks, and you've got to show all your results within 12 months. There, go fulfill your potential, right? So you see how it's a, it's a holistic problem, and just addressing the executive compensation issue alone isn't it. I mean, to go into Apple and, and uh, Johnny Ive's lab and have all those toys to work with, you know, all those things to do to really fulfill your potential versus going to an office with just a desk. There are three elements, I think, b besides psychic benefit to, to compensation. One is the ability to fulfill your potential. One is the salary that you're being offered at the start. And the other is ongoing incentive to produce even more. It's not enough to say, okay, we were going to pay uh, a new development director $150,000. We've read Dan's book. We're going to stretch and we're going to pay $185,000. All right, well, that person now knows I earn $185,000. No matter what I do or don't do, as long as I don't really screw up, I earn $185,000. Well, they might have visions of I want to put an in-ground swimming pool in for my kids. I want to take them uh, you know, to Europe. I want to buy a, a house up in the mountains in the winter. And... The idea of, hey, I could make some more money in addition to uh, doing good would really appeal to them. So your question was, how do, how do we address funders? Methodically and en masse. Um, it's not one thing that we say in a meeting with a funder. 
It's we have to start to develop methodical strategies. How over the course of the next three years am I going to change the way my funders think about this? What curricula am I going to put together? What meetings am I going to have with them? What seminars am I going to put together to educate them? And, and then what can I do with the other members of my community? Um, how can we all come together? All of the you know, nonprofit organizations in Manhattan and sign a joint letter signed by 600 nonprofit organizations to all of the local foundations that fund us saying, hey, you're getting this all wrong and it's killing us. So I think, I think those two things, we have to stop acting alone. Um, and I would say we have to act with courage, but I think it's putting the cart before the horse. We'll, we'll find more courage if we start to act together. My name is Andy Guerrero. I'm an MBA student here at Stern. Um, and my question is a little bit bigger picture with kind of a misalignment I'm seeing between what nonprofits are doing and their mission and what you're getting at in terms of you kind of want philanthropists to be taking a longer term growth minded viewpoint, kind of like they would for a business, like you mentioned a lot of for profits in that sense. But a lot of what draws philanthropists to the nonprofit sector is the mission and its urgency. It's I want to feed this hungry person now. I want to educate this student now. So how do you kind of reconcile the short-term nature of nonprofits really trying to solve problems that are pervasive right now and investors putting into a long-term mindset? Well, I think number one, if you ask the invest investor, you know, do you really want to uh, end homelessness, let's say in Boston within the next 10 years, they would say, Absolutely. Is there a way to do that? Is there like, are you serious about an effort to do that? I, I want to invest in that, you know, like that famous Barnum quote, make no small plans. They have no power to stir people's bloods and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans. So I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I think I think we do both things at the same time and we find other pools of capital other than the donation so that the donation can continue to um, uh, serve present day needs and we use other capital that could come from donors to grow things for the long term. Thanks. Well, great. Um, I want to thank you for a really I'll be happy to take your two questions. Out. Thank you so Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. That's all right. It's all right.